welcome, welcome. I'm Jonathan Friedman, and this is The Common Room, PEN America's conversation series about free speech, diversity, and inclusion in higher education. PEN America's mission is to celebrate creative expression and defend the civil liberties that make it possible. And I invite those of you in attendance today to consider joining our national membership of writers, journalists, and scholars and their allies in support of our mission. Today, we'll be tackling a uh, pressing issue in the realm of higher education, the question of what the Biden administration will be doing, should be doing, might prioritize for free speech and inclusion in higher education. I'm delighted to be joined by three experts on the topic. Joe Cohn, Legislative and Policy Director at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Joe leads FIRE's efforts to defend and advance the cause of students' rights through legislative advocacy. Thank you for having me, John. Thanks for being here, Joe. Uh, second, Lara Schwartz, a professional lecturer in the Department of Government and director of the Project on Civil Discourse at American University, who specializes in civil discourse and campus speech, constitutional law, civil rights, politics, communications, and policy. She's also the co-author of How to College, What to Know Before You Go and When You're There. Hey, John. Hi, Lara. And third, Roger Worthington, professor in the Department of Counseling, Higher Education and Special Education at the University of Maryland and the founder and executive director of the university's Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education. Roger is an internationally recognized scholar and higher education consultant on issues of diversity and in counseling and education. Hi, Roger. John, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Before we get to the main topic of the hour, all here are reminded that this is meant to be a forum for interaction and open dialogue. And, you know, we ask that everybody speak to one another with respect and remember, of course, to mute when not speaking. We'll reserve time for questions from the audience in the second half of the program, but all are invited to put comments or questions in the chat during the session as we get going. So to the topic of the hour, the Biden administration and free speech and inclusion on campus. Joe, I thought we would start with you, uh, helping us to look back a little bit at and set a common baseline for our conversation today. So let's talk about the last four years. There's been no shortage of a national attention to issues of free speech on campus, including at the highest levels of the Trump administration from uh, former President Trump and former Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos themselves. Um, I thought I would just ask you a little bit uh, uh, at the start, if you could summarize briefly for our audience who may not be familiar, what do you see as the most significant actions that the previous administration took to address free speech on campus in the past four years? That's right, John. There's been a lot that's happened in the last four years with respect to how the federal government has engaged on the issue of free speech on college campuses. And there, I'm gonna take you through a few of the most prominent actions the federal government has taken uh, without editorializing at this point uh, in the conversation. Uh, I hope that will happen throughout the, throughout the hour. Uh, but I just wanna make sure that everyone in the audience kind of just understands you know, what indeed has happened. And there have been a number of steps that the government has, uh, has taken. Uh, the first thing of note is that the president issued an executive order on improving free inquiry, transparency, and accountability at colleges and universities uh, on March uh, of 2019. And that executive order instructed federal agencies to take appropriate steps to ensure that when they give either educational or research grants, uh, that they don't promote censorship on college campuses or that they are actively promoting free inquiry. Um, and, you know, I'll, later on again, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about what's happened under that EO, whether it's good or bad uh, or mixed bag. Um, but that was one of the first significant steps the administration took. Uh, the Department of Education implemented regulations largely designed to implement that executive order in September, 2020. They also added on protections for religious liberty uh, that uh, were controversial to some, welcomed by some communities, criticized by others. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit, I'm sure. Um, then there was a uh, huge event that has shaped uh, the educational landscape, which was the regulations from the Department of Education on Title IX. 
Title IX being the anti-discrimination uh, statute dealing with sex-based discrimination in education, both K through 12 and higher ed. Most of that focused around uh, sexual harassment and due process protections that exist in that context. But, uh, but the part that affects free speech uh, is how it dealt with uh, and defined sexual harassment uh, itself. Um, then uh, there was an executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping that uh, authorized federal agencies to condition uh, grants that they administer to recipient educational institutions, requiring them to certify that their funds won't be used to promote, and the word they used was promote, uh, certain interpretations of race and sex stereotyping that the administration deemed offensive. Um, and uh, again, we'll dive into the details on that. That executive order has already been rescinded. Uh, and then um, another uh, act that the administration took, which I don't think we'll probably talk about in depth today for time purposes to make sure the rest of the conversation has some substance to, to it, is that it issued an executive order on combat, combating anti-Semitism that locked in some policy that several administrations in a row had used to deal with some cases of anti-Semitism, but added in as well a controversial definition of anti-Semitism that we at FIRE would argue includes protected speech. Uh, so that's the overview of what has happened in the last four years, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Joe. And uh, so I, I counted there are at least five different uh, things, major things, and we'll we'll kind of try to take them up in turn. But uh, wanted to bring you into the conversation next, Roger, to talk a little bit about you know how you have uh, experienced, I think, the past four years in terms of these executive orders and other actions. Uh, you've been a professor at a public institution and a national advocate for diversity and inclusion. I am I imagine that it's the the last one, the the executive order on. Uh, race and sex stereotyping that has been the most significant, but I thought you could talk just broadly about that and, you know, the, the Trump administration and its efforts on campus free speech and as a whole, uh, what kind of impact did it have on your work and on, you know, higher education generally? Absolutely. And thank you for raising that issue. I, I won't speak long. I think this should be a good conversational kind of program, but um, you know, one of the things that I think is most important, as you point out, is the executive order on race and sex stereotyping. And, and you know, I think, you know, when you ask the question, uh, what can the Biden administration do uh, moving forward, the, he's already taken the first step, which is to rescind that executive order by the Trump administration. And one of the reasons that's so important is because it actually was criticized by so many people as having a chilling effect on free speech on college campuses. And, uh, you know, a lot of people actually who even follow the news may not have known that college and universities as uh, recipients of government contracts were covered under that uh, executive order. And that as a result, many people uh, immediately pulled all of their diversity and inclusion programming uh, down to a halt and started uh, reviewing uh, the kinds of material that people were, were delivering in, the, in those programs with special emphasis on uh, terms like critical race theory uh, and privilege and uh, microaggressions. And, and those terms in particular being highlighted in the executive order as uh, problematic and potentially uh, prompting the federal government to withdraw funding for, uh, as, as federal contractors. So that's, that's one of the most important things that I would say has already happened. And not only did he rescind that order, but he also replaced it with uh, two executive orders, one that really in, in this that the federal government review the kinds of efforts that it has ongoing in these areas in a way that uh, 
um, truly promotes civil rights uh, as it should in, in the interpretation of the Supreme Court. And then in addition to that, um, advocating uh, a, an executive order advocating on behalf of LGBTQ plus individuals uh, and ensuring that they are not discriminated against on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation as well. And really promoting uh, that set of issues along with uh, the rescinding of the original executive order by the Trump administration. I'll pause there. I, I have some more ideas that I wanna share with you, but I wanna let everybody else jump in. Thanks, Roger. And um, um, absolutely, already we're seeing actions taken by the Biden administration and uh, we could see more. And we'll, let's come to that in a minute, but I, I wanna kind of think more a little bit as we reflect on um, you know, the things that, that Joe summarized in the past four years as well. Lara, I know as a civil rights advocate, as a professor, as the leader of a, a project that focuses on how do we promote discourse, um, you've been following these issues very closely over the past few years, years and just wanted to get your sense of them. Joe was, Joe was hinting that there's some positive, some negative, some abridgment of free speech, but otherwise uh, some efforts that seem to be reinforcing free speech. How have You've seen these efforts by the Trump administration in the past few years. Um, the administration's efforts around campus speech were very consistent with the administration's hostility to racial justice protest and hostility to racial justice advocacy. So even people who don't, like we do, spend a lot of time talking about speech on campus, they're going to be most familiar with the former president's um, attitude toward, for example, Colin Kaepernick and taking a knee. You know, he expressed a position that people who engage in this kind of peaceful, silent racial justice protest should lose their jobs, that they're disgraceful, that they're anti, um, that they're anti-American, anti-patriotic. And that, of course, is not campus speech, and it's not constitutionally protected speech necessarily because, you know, the NFL is, is, not, is not the government. Um, but it, it very much sets the context for what we see with the Trump administration's other actions with regard to free speech. So we have the initial speech order from March 2019, which was really troubling to a lot of lawyers, a lot of people who care about freedom to protest, because it seemed to put schools in the situation of potentially having to um, squelch counter speech, um, particularly racial justice protests that might rise up in reaction to invited speakers who express racism or transphobia or Islamophobia. And again, this is consistent with the context that the administration had had and the president had had talking about where he very much liked the, you know, he called his followers beating up a homeless person passion, but he called people who, you know, used, uh, profane words to describe silent racial justice protesters in the NFL. And this um, initial executive order, it, it had this problem of being quite vague to where um, universities would have a tough time knowing if they were complying with it and whether they were under some kind of obligation to squelch counter protest, which might often be the kind of protest you were seeing on campuses, which is itself First Amendment speech. Then, as Roger um, mentioned, there was this order now rescinded um, around diversity and equity education, which essentially takes a category of speech and really hits the most squarely First Amendment offensive thing you can do, which is, is viewpoint discrimination. Taking a viewpoint and saying, you know, this viewpoint is off limits and we're going to punish people who who use this viewpoint, who engage in this viewpoint. And again, it's, it's wrapped up in the language of freedom as the 2019 order, which was vague and I, you know, um, and, and, and really was problematic for protected First Amendment counter speech. Um, it was wrapped up in civil liberties language mm -hmm. of, you know, the problem with this kind of speech is that it's race and sex stereotyping. And us, you know, lawyers recognize that as the language of, for example, interpretations of civil rights laws like Title VII that, that define discrimination to include these kinds of, of stereotyping. And I think it's done very carefully and intentionally to wrap um, absolutely, you know, First Amendment prohibited viewpoint discrimination in the language of civil rights and protection um, that's been rescinded, so we don't have, you know, 
it's, it's a point of us for history as opposed to for current po public policy making. But overall, the package is one in which um, they're using, the, the administration sort of used its muscle against calls for racial justice um, writ large. You know, John, if, if I can jump in for a moment, I'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate. I agree with a bit of what I've heard from, from, from both of my panelists and disagree with other parts, um, you know, for sure. I, uh, I, you know, starting just real quickly with some of the areas of agreement, um, you know, the president has certainly himself uh, targeted freedom of press uh, and other First Amendment freedoms inconsistently uh, in ways that uh, it's low hanging fruit to point out, uh, you know, hypocrisy. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that, uh, and I think that that's important, you know, context, of course. Um, but a few things I'd like to say about the two different executive orders in ways that I think that they are partially misunderstood uh, across the board by, you know, by, by people in academia and others who have critiqued them. The first executive order that was talked about, the race and, 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 and sex-based stereotyping executive order, um, uh, did include things that I thought would, would encourage the chilling effect uh, that, uh, that uh, Roger was, was talking about and, and fire out the gate highlighted our concerns about that. But our concerns about the chilling effect were largely because you're aiming an executive order at non-lawyers you know, who are looking at the lay general broad message. Um, some of the things that were just in the executive order, uh, you know, we're not telling faculty they couldn't teach things, but telling that schools in their own training materials are telling as statements of fact to all of the students, they can't tell students that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. Does anyone think that a school could say all white people are inherently superior to black people in its actual formal training and not be in violation of Title VI or equal protection, et cetera. Of course not. Um, you know, so when you go down the list of a lot of these things, it didn't include microaggressions. It didn't actually talk about critical race theory. Um, it didn't talk about any of those things. An individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his race or sex. That was one of the things they were telling the institution they couldn't do in their broad trainings. Um, so uh, the chilling effect I thought was real. It, it resulted in the exact problem that Roger was highlighting of schools pulling their anti-discrimination trainings writ large, um, but it didn't actually order them to do that or anywhere close. Uh, it also only prevented them from using the funds that were given in that grant for those purposes. So they could still even do those trainings on their own at the risk of violating Title VI if they use different monies. Um, I know I'm talking a heck of a lot. Uh, I have some thoughts on the other uh, executive order too, but hopefully those will come in later. Well, well let's stay on this one for a minute because um, um, you know I, I think that there was certainly the impression in much of higher education uh, that it wasn't only you know government funding, but that it would could kind of put at risk uh, all government funding if other funds were even being used to talk about some of these. Uh, issues or present some of these conversations. And, you know, that that concern about the chilling effect, you know, I think is quite significant because it's, it's one thing to have that kind of general uh, chilling effect in the sector around those conversations as a whole. But you also did have, I think, some universities, you know, telling people quite explicitly, you know, you can't do this training or don't say those phrases. There was a, a, a draft that came out of Stanford, which we, they then kind of denied that included the phrase, you know, that you couldn't say, I don't know, Stanford University telling people who work for it that you can't call it racist. You know, it seems like those effects were, I don't know, at, le at the very least, you know, in the kindest, most generous way to put it, I mean, not well anticipated and, and clearly, you know, calculated to cause a degree or, or not calculated at all, but certainly caused a degree of confusion. Roger, why don't you come in here? Yeah, sure. And and as you bring up the, the Stanford uh, policy that they crafted and publicized in response to the executive order. Uh, when I read that, I was really shocked. I was, I was quite surprised that an institution like Stanford would interpret it so literally and actually uh, take the rather extreme steps, I felt, uh, to really squelch uh, 
diversity, equity, and inclusion training uh, in, uh, in their institution. Other institutions didn't do that. My own institution did, you know, sort of uh, inquire for those of us who were engaged in this work, uh, are there going to be potential tripwires? Are there going to be issues that um, come up that they needed to be aware of? But they did not take any steps at all to inhibit or reduce or, uh, you know, ban uh, any kind of speech on uh, training and so on. And I would and I would take issue with the idea that um, you know it it wasn't um, explicitly. Uh, a violation of the First Amendment. The Ninth Circuit certainly agrees with me that when, you know, uh, early on, they actually um, made a clear statement about the violation of the First Amendment in the executive order and how uh, they were taking their action uh, on that basis. And so I think that's a really important thing. This, uh, the, you know, the executive order was dead in the water before Biden even had a chance to rescind it. Uh, because of that, and and the the uh, enforcement of the order was halted uh, by federal agencies as a result of that Ninth Circuit decision as well. So I think you know that's a really important set of issues. The other one is the is the is the hypocrisy that Joe points out as well, which I think is really important because in part one of the things that the executive order did was to describe these kinds of um, what they were calling racial and sex stereotyping only as La Lara pointed out, uh, you know, as viewpoint discrimination, um, they described those as a host potential hostile work environment, which again is something around issues of race has not been uh, described in exactly the same way as sexual harassment has. And there's been a great deal of controversy. And I I'd like to touch on that a little bit and hear other people's viewpoints mm -hmm. about that set of issues, how they approach that. Lara, did you wanna come in here? Sure, so I think I, I actually concur with, with all that Roger said and as well, I would say that the language of it, you know, the question of whether Stanford actually interpreted it, that we'll do what they, I'll say that they did what I would call reading the room. Um, the language, if you get complaints at your university about your diversity, equity, education, if you get complaints about your multicultural education mm -hmm. at your school district, um, I remember last year, you know, Santa Barbara um, and, and, the, um, and the diversity and equity education nonprofit that creates its diversity and equity training for their students were sued by a concerned um, group that, that, that ultimately was dismissed, utilizing the exact same language to describe their diversity and equity education, which is, you and, and these are the commonly used in people attacking diversity and equity initiatives on campus, um, the language is, because if you say, um, gee, I don't like it when students are taught to be nice, <laughs> nobody's going to agree with you. So the language and the framing is, this is education that teaches that white people are bad. This is education that teaches about white privilege. And that's a way of saying that white people bear a guilt for something by association that they don't have. This is education that stereotypes, it's education that looks at groups rather than the individual merit of the people. And the, the language of the executive order is, is the exact language of talking points of people who attack this kind of education. Um, and as well, in the case of, you know, I'm thinking of the Santa Barbara case, the even the language of a complaint. Um, so I think we have to look at things in that context. Now, the Supreme Court has said, <laughs> um, in the case regarding the travel ban, look, the president can say Muslim ban a thousand times, but if his more thoughtful staff writes something that looks more neutral, we'll pretend together that it doesn't mean that. Um, but I think this diversity equity um, order comes in the context of someone telling you exactly what he means again and again and again throughout the administration. And we need to see it in that context schools that are being very careful and risk averse in that way, you know, we are now out the other side of the election. Um, 
And so this isn't the mindset we have, but they were looking at the possibility that their school could be like, you know, Princeton or anywhere else, subject to this administration making good on its, um, on, on its executive order and, and going after them. So I'm, I'm glad my school didn't do, you know, a, a reaction like Stanford, but the part of me that's a nervous, paranoid lawyer is like, well, you know, I get it. You know, I, I, I agree with Laura a lot on, you know, on, you know, the context here, which is why FIRE took a very early position that the executive order would have a very predictable chilling effect, right? And it might have even been intended to do that, you know, based on the president's attitudes. But I looking and reading the actual text of the executive order, schools like Stanford definitely went further than what it required of them to do um, because of potentially the fear in that context. Uh, but those decisions weren't really justifiable. Like you can't say as a lawyer that it was a good idea to read that executive order and say that we will be doing no diversity and inclusion, you know, training and just pull across across the board and think that that was and say with a straight face that that was what the executive order demanded. It didn't. You know, I think it's 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 interesting because to me it also raises another question, which is you know, like as government, right? What is the best way to you know, intervene on these issues. And here, I think there are lessons, you know, even if, you know, I think there is some debate here, but there are lessons that can be learned about the ways in which the Trump and DeVos administrations, you know, approached these issues. So Joe, I'm curious to hear, you know, how you think about like, what is the appropriate role for the government to be having in, in these conversations around free speech? I mean, it is a little bit delicate because on one hand, we have the First Amendment, you know, suggesting that governments shouldn't be, you know, creating laws or policing speech. But on the other hand, under tremendous pr pressure, I mean, as certainly we've seen from the conservative base to make sure that they're defending free speech on college campuses um, and, and kind of wanting to do something also around whether we call it diversity, whether we call it equity, whether we call it inclusion, um, other, um, you know, other elements that are necessary and central to the mission of universities. What do you see as what's appropriate? Yeah, well, as vice president, President Biden uh, in an interview uh, talked about what he viewed as a disturbing trend of people trying to shut down their opponents as opposed to debating them. Uh, President Obama had also echoed uh, similar uh, sentiments and I have a long long list of elected officials on both sides of the aisle to do that. So continuing to kind of publicly discuss that is one uh, easy way that a president can help kind of persuade their own base uh, to be charitable about under, you know, understanding the need to allow their adversaries to make their cases. So that, that's one thing. Um, the second thing uh, that can and should be done uh, by the federal government is that in the areas that it intervenes in, in enforcing anti-discrimination law, it should not be instructing schools to use unconstitutional definitions. It should be parroting what the courts have said is the line from when uh, speech loses its protection because it becomes conduct that is then discriminatory. And it shouldn't be reinventing uh, those lines. So that's the most important thing uh, that the federal government should be doing. Uh, and there are a number of other smaller steps uh, that they could be taking uh, as well. Intruding in on what can be taught in the classroom is not what they should be doing at all. Lara, Roger. I'll defer to Lara. Okay. Um, well, so let me let me jump in and say, you know, I think, um, you know, it's it's interesting to talk about some of the policies that the former president, uh, you know, enacted uh, through his executive orders. Um, but what we're really here to do is talk about what the new administration can do proactively to really make a difference in this way. And I have a, a couple of ideas that I want to throw out and, and see if we can get some dialogue around that. And, and, and certainly one of them is to um, really um, calm the, the country a bit, right? Um, to, to, to lower the temperature. And I think that's certainly one of the things that you've heard uh, 
President Biden say again and again, lower the temperature. You, you've heard Vice President Harris say that as well. And, and I think that that's a really important and necessary thing to do. And, and one of the ways that you can do that around this particular set of issues, I think, is to stop dichotomizing this notion that free speech and diversity, inclusion, and social justice are in opposition to one another. That in reality, those things have historically been uniquely tied very closely to one another. The civil rights movement would have died in the water itself without the protection of free speech. And we are in a really critical historical moment in our country right now, where these deep divisions that have caused an insurgency in our country are really starting to rise up and create such a heat that we're in danger as a democracy. Um, and I think that one of the ways that we can really hope that a Biden administration will take action proactively on these kinds of things is by really actively helping people in higher education to engage in discourse across differences, whether those differences are ideological around political issues or whether they really arise around differences on race, on gender, on sexual orientation, on religious basis and others. And really facilitating intergroup dialogues or difficult dialogues in a way that will help advance people's understanding of one another, help people find common ground on issues that they agree with. I mean, the three of us are having a difficult dialogue right now and there are things that we agree about. And I think we can promote that more on college and university campuses and the Biden administration has the capacity to help us do that. Through, through, through executive order? Through executive order, Roger, or other means? Well, I, I don't know that I would, would say it has to happen through executive order. It certainly could, but I, I, would, I would promote um, the idea that there could be a bipartisan push because of, you know, at least in some ways, you know, both sides of the aisle having some concerns about free expression, free speech. And they may, you know, talk about them differently uh, from different perspectives, but there is some common ground that it is necessary and that we want to, you know, sort of calm the waters a bit. And, and so I think maybe some legislation and, and you know, promoting uh, programs and initiatives that would advance dialogue. So Lara. I think that um, I absolutely agree with that. And um, yeah, there's a ton of common ground here because I think every one of us, you know, and sometimes it means how, if, if we're on a campus as Roger and I are, you know, it means having a tough conversation with people on your campus, you know, this speech is protected and it's different from liking it. But yeah, I think there, there are some specific things can do, he can do. Um, then President Clinton was faced with with uh, what what felt to a lot of people like a dichotomy between religious liberty, right, and um, and with free exercise of religion and establishment of religion with with school prayer, and issued guidance that said, you know, those of you that are very upset that the courts have said that there can't be the these school led school prayers that proselytize to people, you know, you should know that legally the students can be praying, exercising their own conscience. And, and engaging in prayer, what's what can't happen is that it's that it's led by, led is led by the teachers that these students are you know indoctrinated in this way. That's that's the thing. And the idea is you take the temperature down. If you're worried that you know quote God has been kicked out of schools, that's not what's happened. Here we have. I agree with Roger that the idea of free speech and diversity, inclusion, racial justice, social justice, gender justice. As, as at odds is, is fabricated and false. Free speech is the engine of social justice. Free speech is how we acquire and fight for social justice. And 
limitations on speech, I think Joe would agree with this, are actually most often deployed right against racial justice activists. You know, the free speech, uh, Berkeley free speech movement comes out of anti-war and pro-racial justice. So, you know, the, the idea of these being two things in tension, I think really doesn't hold up, but it is the reputation, it is the concern out there. So the administration can issue guidance that says, we're going to protect speech and here's what protected speech looks like. And we'd actually rather encourage private colleges to consider that this is a framework to respect. You know, This is what free speech looks like and diversity and inclusion education designed to get students thinking about how they use that freedom is not a violation of their free speech rights. It's not a violation of their freedom of conscience any more than education telling you, you know, smoking will hurt you is a violation of their freedom of conscience. If you're going to tell students, you know, when you engage in microaggressions, when you treat your fellow students this way, it's really hurting them. If you're not ultimately engaging in, in censorship, punishment of First Amendment protected activity, your educational um, diversity initiatives designed to help students be good at this, be good at these tough conversations um, is fine. And I would say as well, um, as somebody who thinks a lot about the college transition, um, as John mentioned, you know, I wrote this book, co-wrote this book about making the transition from high school to college. This administration, I think, has an opportunity to get a conversation going about the fact that we're not preparing our students for the kind of robust constitutionally protected speech that's expected, encouraged, on and protected on college campuses. Because K to 12 education is an enormously speech limited environment um, the case, ever, all of my students' favorite case, the bong hits for Jesus case, Morris B. Frederick, says that students, students love this case, right? Um, but, not, but the outcome they shouldn't, right? Says that, that schools have this enormous, enormous power to limit student speech and expression, and it's deployed in all kinds of ways that should be really troubling to, this, to the racial justice-minded students, too. This is how you get punishments for people's natural hair and for their bra straps and for the curvature of their bodies that are primarily deployed against black people, and particularly black girls, right? Um, so there's a case right now, the cheerleader profanity case um, that the Supreme Court's taking up about the, um, the right of a school to punish students for out of school speech that is in no way related, for example, to their relationships with other students. It doesn't relate to harassment. And I actually think the Biden administration has a chance to say, can we all talk about not doing this to students because we're not giving students, we're not giving them the opportunity to practice their free speech in the K to 12 environment. And I think conservatives should agree with this too, although I'm saying it from a justice perspective that's more on the liberal side, because what could be more a parent's role than deciding if your kid has crossed the line in the kind of language that they use unrelated to their schoolwork? You know, this doesn't sound like government's business to me. So I'd actually like to hear the Biden administration take some leadership in asking schools to pull back on exercising the power that the courts gave them in Morse, whether it comes to expression that's political, expression that's profane, expression that's a bra strap. And I think that would be enormously valuable. You know, I, I have to, I feel like I have to rewrite my closing uh, comments because literally it was almost verbatim what Roger had said, which I was saving uh, for later, um, you know, in terms of taking the temperature uh, 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 down and fostering and fostering dialogue. And it wasn't in my closing remarks. I just, my mind wasn't going there. But I have often spoken too about what Laura was just uh, was just uh, talking about in terms of the historical, uh, uh, you know, ways that free speech has really been the driving engine uh, behind every advancement in civil liberties uh, in American history, uh, and that I also think that the the dichotomy is false. Um, 
in terms of what the actual case law and the value of free speech, where I don't think it, you know, I don't think, however, that we can pretend that there isn't a tension on college campuses today about how the power of censorship is being yielded uh, uh, along the lines of the tensions between uh, equality and, and what one can say. I think it's profoundly being, being wielded as a weapon right now, um, you know, censorship, uh, you know, as a tool to promote uh, e equality in a way that is counterproductive for all of the reasons, you know, that, uh, that go into why free speech is so important and how it only works when it, when it is meaningfully uh, a right that's enjoyed by, by all. Um, so, uh, so yes, a, a tremendous amount of agreement. You know, I'm curious, Joe, though, yeah, I, I agree. There's been, we've seen this kind of spate of cases where there are really difficult questions being raised about where the line between, you know, academic freedom, free speech, you know, classroom conduct, um, and, you know, creating a campus where all feel included, all have an equal right uh, to be there and are, you know, trying to kind of have a conscientiousness around, you know, the marginalization of, uh, well, minorities and others, other historically um, less powerful groups in society. But, you know, my question to you would be, you know, when we think about the tools of how government can do something about this and how they shouldn't, one of the things that has, was really alarming to me in the past few years has been this, this, you know, the punitive approach that Trump and DeVos and others took. You know, you didn't mention actually um, the launching of investigations to a few colleges and universities around uh, these free speech incidents that took place there. And they might be incidents where, you know, administrators of universities and colleges, you know, took the wrong move, could have handled things better, could have prepared for situations better. I think there's no doubt that there is a, um, you know, it's often a lack of understanding of the complexity of these situations and perhaps, um, you know, uh, greater education that could be advanced for this. But I'm curious to hear you think about, you know, is, is a punitive approach to Campley the best way to go? Are there other approaches that you'd like to see or could imagine the Biden administration taking? Because, I mean, it, it, you're right. It is silly to say there's no issues around free speech on campuses and there's no censorship taking place or, you know, uh, you know, there are, you know, numerous studies that have shown students are, you know, nervous about talking to one another, that professors are nervous about talking. We've seen a whole bunch of professors essentially, you know, flee Twitter because they all keep getting fired over things that they're saying because you have know, student complaints. And that's on both sides of the political spectrum. So, you know, what, what do you think is the best way to intervene here? So when I look at crafting remedies, uh, whether it's in a state statute dealing with uh, expressive rights or when I'm talking to Congress, the Department of Education or anyone else, I like to put to make it easier for aggrieved parties to have their cases heard. And one of the contexts here, just to you know, try to flesh it out as quickly as I can, is if you think about it, there are two ways you can be censored, broadly speaking. You could be punished for having engaged in protected speech, or you can be prevented from speaking in the first place of what we refer to as a prior restraint. Well, in the first category of cases, courts have had no problem seeing that you're entitled to damages. You're expelled for protected speech. They see the long economic harm that causes you, and they've entertained those cases pretty well. In the prior restraint cases, they tend to have view, to view them in terms of injunctive relief alone. The problem with that is that students graduate and the courts, many courts have interpreted their graduation as mooting out the cases because they're no longer subject to the same, you know, to the same rule that censored them in the first place. The Supreme Court heard arguments on this uh, issue just two weeks ago. Um, and what we found at FIRE is that it's easy to advocate in the prior restraint cases for freshmen and sophomore who have years to adjudicate it. But if a senior or a graduate student on a shorter program has a prior restraint issue, it's very hard to get them a lawyer willing to take their case because they could do the work and get it mooted out. That was why we started going to, to, to legislatures in the first place to fill what we called that graduation loophole. And, uh, and improving the remedy to make sure courts had to issue an opinion was a light-handed touch that didn't require governments to adjust what the courts are saying the line was. So in terms of carrot and stick, uh, I think the, the stick of court is always an appropriate one, um, but, uh, 
but you, this, the government should use a lighter touch on the kinds of fines and access to funding uh, to, to coerce behavior, uh, you know, at the same time. And I, I would agree in, in many ways. And, and I, I would also um, only vary in the sense that I, I think that a proactive approach is the ultimately the best approach. And that um, the, the Biden administration can use the power of the pocketbook, essentially, uh, much like most administrations have through the Department of Education potentially develop an initiative for free speech in higher education. And one of the things that I would do with that is, you know, I want to acknowledge that, you know, uh, that FIRE has, you know, worked on, you know, evaluating what is going on on college campuses around students' attitudes in particular around First Amendment rights. And one of the things that is so interesting, there's there's a Knight Foundation study that's cited on the FIRE website. And, and that study finds gender differences, racial differences, religious differences, uh, and sexual orientation differences in people's attitudes about what's more important in terms of free speech rights or social justice advocacy. And what you find consistently is really similar to the work that I do in what's called campus climate. Um, the experience of a climate on campus, you see essentially the reverse of those same trends about the uh, preference for social justice over free speech, which is people of color, women, uh, people who belong to religious minorities and LGBTQ individuals tend to experience the climate on a campus less favorably than their majority, so-called majority counterparts, privileged counterparts would express themselves. And it's the reverse of that. Um, it's the more privileged students on campus that are expressing uh, priority around free speech rights. And, and what I would like to see happen around this particular issue is to join those two sets of data and to really say that there has to be a reason for that. Why are those minoritized and marginalized students saying that they don't prioritize First Amendment rights, that they do prioritize social justice rights? And that's in part because there are, you know, extremists, smaller groups of individuals who have weaponized free speech as a way of disrupting, attacking, and really traumatizing individuals on college and university campuses. And while it's protected speech, unless it crosses a certain line, we have to do the proactive work of developing initiatives that help people to see how they can have dialogue across differences in ways that are productive and impactful and fulfill the educational mission of our institutions. Roger, let me just ask you, you know, on that point, you know, as we think about what the Biden administration might do in the realm of equity, diversity, inclusion, racial justice, I mean, you know, you're someone who has that long view of history as you were talking about the um, ways in which, you know, we've talked, met a few people, but a few of us have mentioned this, the ways in which the civil rights movement and other um, movements for justice have used free speech. You know, do you harbor any concerns that the government or, you know, higher education actors, you know, could in crafting efforts to improve the climate for speech on campus, you know, not necessarily directly um, attempt to, for, uh, you know, quiet or quell free speech, but could have a degree of a chilling effect on, you know, classroom conversations where there might be people with, you know, contrarian viewpoints or uh, alternative views and that 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 kind of that it too could lead to a climate of silencing, perhaps not different from from that, you know, which we're thinking, uh, uh, you know, the Trump administration had a role in, you know, do you, does that cause you concern? It it, it has in the past in, in a, maybe a slightly different way than you're describing. Um, and, and what I want to point out here is I've actually done research uh, a number of years ago, and it was climate research. It was, it was people's experience of the climate. And we, and we asked people who were more conservative and people who were more liberal 
uh, to tell us whether or not they had experienced the kinds of things that you're describing. Uh, the you know stifling of their viewpoints in the classroom by professors or in other ways on campus. And the interesting thing about our findings was that uh, the liberal students felt that there were conservative professors who were squelching their free speech. And there were conservative students that were saying that to some degree there were liberal professors who were squelching their free speech. And the professors themselves were all essentially saying, I try not to do that, even if I do express my own personal viewpoints in the classroom, I want to try and encourage people to have their own viewpoints and to have difficult dialogues in the classroom. And as Lara pointed out, people are afraid to do that, in part because the, the complaints that people receive when their viewpoint is actually challenged. Uh, and so the, I think the, the, the real nuanced issue around this is how do we prepare the faculty to engage in difficult dialogues in the classroom? How do we prepare staff to help students engage in difficult dialogues across the co-curriculum as well, and to do that in ways that really advances our educational missions as uh, higher education institutions. And, and I think, you know, preparing, that's absolutely right, and preparing teachers and also just recognizing where we are now um, in terms of the faculty experience and the students experience in classrooms. So I think that research on how students are perceiving the um, the educational environment, it can be enormously helpful, um, but it doesn't tell us everything. Um, I'm intrigued when I see that the most recent research showed that it was black students who were the least likely to say they felt that the space was, you know, comfortable and okay for them to be talking about race. So that very much goes against the kind of oh, it must be, you know, the woke mob says people can't, you know, be anything but woke because that, that's not what it showed. But, you know, the subjective um, experience that a student has in a classroom, you know, I feel really silenced. Um, it doesn't necessarily translate to faculty or institutional behavior. In part, it can be the difference between you've come from a you've come from a background where almost everyone is let's say conservative rural and you've come to a much more diverse um, university setting where you you're for the first time not being the majority opinion what is that like for you as opposed to someone who's who who hasn't made that change in college but then and I, I really would like to look at that you know not just what do students in the aggregate think but instead of saying well, a college is doing this well if more students feel comfortable, that might only just reflect the fact that more of the students in that college came from sort of intellectually, ideologically diverse places, like let's say a suburban Pennsylvania or New Jersey compared to an Oklahoma or Washington DC. But the other is the elephant in the room in terms of people having their ideas squelched. So I teach, I'm done teaching for the week, but when I go back to the classroom on Tuesday, we're not going to entertain the Jewish space laser seriously as, as, as an idea. Now a member of Congress has put that forth, right? So it's serious in the sense of, you know, the voters of, of a district have, have put the, the originator of that concept into Congress, but, but, it's, but it's not gonna be in my classroom given space to be interrogated other than as a problem of the misinformation landscape in which we live or the, or the grow, growing extre extremism in which we might live. And I, I don't have, um, I don't have a magic anything, but I would say that one thing that the Biden administration should consider is something along the lines of a misinformation moonshot, not in terms of punitive one, but we need to infuse from kindergarten through civic education and, you know, in our nursing facilities for older people, um, a way to engage with information, engage with disinformation and misinformation, become a good utilizer and curator of information. Because if I'm saying, hey, Jewish space laser, not a thing, in my class, this isn't a First Amendment issue 
it's it's a disinformation and radicalization issue. And and I do think um, it's it's appropriate for the federal government to consider how to invest resources in a, in, a, in approaching that issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what I've heard from both of, uh, of, of the panelists beforehand. I don't know that any one uh, social phenomenon explains all of this. Um, certainly media literacy, I think, would be very helpful. Um, I, I, I think that historically, it's, uh, I think everyone on, the, on this uh, panel would agree that censorship has not been a partisan uh, sport uh, in that uh, and that only one side has engaged in it and only one side was the target of it. Certainly it's often wielded in partisan ways, um, but at, uh, fires case files are just full with people at every part of the spectrum who have been targeted with censorship and full of examples where people of different part po politics were the ones behind the censorship. Um, and, uh, and I think that who's in charge at an institution is more likely, and their politics is more likely to tell you about who will be censored when it is about a political confrontation uh, th than anything else. And of course, so much college censorship isn't about partisan politics at all, but about not wanting to rock the boat, you know, on the school and not having divisiveness uh, as well. Um, you know, so I I tell as many legislators on either side of the spectrum to police their own side uh, in that, you know, uh, it's easy to try to silence your opposition. It's harder to tell your own colleagues, yet, yeah, hey, no, I disagree with what was said profoundly by this professor, but that's protected. And we see that all of the time. And I tell, you know, folks, don't fall in love with the club that will be used to beat you over the head. You know, don't start making it normal that, that you know, administrators will decide what faculty can teach, what students can say. We, we do see that all the time. And, and um, I wanna just pause here and invite anyone in the audience, if you have a question to please uh, put it in the chat. We'll be turning to audience questions in a minute and all are uh, really welcome on any of the topics we've touched on today. Um, but to that point about state legislators or even congressional elected representatives, you know, it, it, there have been so many instances, and I know this is something that uh, FIRE has been following and, 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 you know, been active on before, where, you know, we see people who are in government, right, elected positions, um, who, who are, uh, you know, unable to kind of signal that support for free speech, even when they react to these. And I'm thinking of a, a number of cases in the past year where, you know, it was whether it was a, something a professor said on Twitter or Facebook, maybe a, they meant it perhaps in jest, some comment that was perhaps originally sort of private or semi-private um, um, uh, to, to uh, you know, the, then suddenly it's kind of picked up or screenshotted and get generates a tremendous amount of outrage. Um, and then we, we kind of see congressional leader, congr uh, uh, members of Congress or even state legislators, you know, writing universities and telling them, you know, that they better fire those professors right away. And so I am greatly concerned about the power that those people have. Some, in some cases, maybe they're even people who have been in conversations or voted for legislation in support of free speech on campus, but don't see or don't kind of see, I don't know if it's kind of hypocrisy or inconsistency or just kind of aren't paying attention enough to how, you know, how do you have those two positions at the same time? Um, not, not to say legislators are always the problem, but I think they have been a problem. You know, I don't mean to jump in again because I know I just talked, but this is the world that I live in. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I know it will shock uh, my co-panelists and the audience that sometimes politicians like the rest of the members of society are hypocrites. And, um, and I've had my own bill sponsors on campus free speech bills turn around and call for faculty people to be fired like the week before a hearing on our campus free speech bill that they were the lead sponsor on. And I had to go out and testify that my own sponsor was wrong about that fact, but that the lines in the actual bill, you know, that would be in place if it was passed years later to eliminate free speech zones would benefit people, you know, for years and years and years to come. And it's not an easy argument to make. Um, so everyone, please tell your own people to try to not, you know, your elected officials, to try to not be manipulative of what can be taught and said on college campuses. Lara, any thoughts on this point? 
Yeah, um, you know, it, I, I agree. Uh, the calls to fire professors are, and I would say that that it goes deeper than that. I mean, that's what you see. That's the tip of the iceberg. But you know, um, overwhelmingly, um, college professors now lack the employment protections that uh, are form a piece of this free speech on campus sort of um, you know overall structure, which is academic freedom, because so many faculty are contingent. And there's very much a consumer type model um, where your school can have a statement regarding your academic freedom, but but it really is not worth anything with with the school's employment models. But I also see that in the chat there's a question that's really um, on point as well. Great, let's go to that. Um, and it's it, just for the audience, it's the Q and A. I apologize, not the chat where we take the questions. Um, so the first question is: Are any of the panelists concerned? that hostile environment suits might be brought forward by aggrieved students using the theory that it pertains to racial discrimination as well as gender discrimination. Uh, Roger, do you wanna take this one first? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I'm not exactly sure that I know how to interpret the question uh, the way it was intended, but um, I, think, I think certainly there is you know, an intersection between race and gender, where what we have found in a lot of research is that the people who are most challenged on our college and university campuses happen to be uh, women of color. Uh, and I, you know, again, I can point to some of my own work in the past where we evaluated in one of the institutions where I used to work, uh, uh, you know, the, the tenure and promotion of women of color on the faculty and that they were the most frequently challenged in those kinds of things. Um, and when it comes to students, um, aggrieved students using the theory that, uh, that a hostile environment pertains to racial discrimination as well as gender discrimination, you know, that's been, uh, that's been a challenge for me ever since I started working in this area because I do think that there is a, an arbitrary demarcation uh, where sexual harassment it can be defining a hostile environment in ways that the same types of behavior, if they were to occur on, a, on the basis of race, would not be considered to be racial harassment or enforced in the same way. And I think that we have to take a look at that. We have to, especially as certain groups and um, maybe more extremist individuals weaponize free speech as a way to target and harass students of color in particular, but people of color, uh, BIPOC individuals on college and university campuses. I think we need to wonder, you know, is this demarcation where we would say that, you know, posting a photo uh, that, you know, is sexually explicit in your office is sexual harassment, but posting something that is racially offensive uh, equivalent is not. Um, and you know, the, it's it's a very <laughs> challenging discussion. One that you know I don't have the answers to, but I do want to point out the discrepancy and the and the arbitrariness of that demarcation. If I can jump in real quickly uh, here. Um, uh, to give us a little step back for folks in the audience who might not know some of these legal uh, terms of art, uh, hostile environment uh, uh, harassment is a, a legal uh, a term that refers to how an, an environment can be permeated uh, with uh, discrimination uh, in a way that prevents its target from having equal access to the benefits and, opportun and educational opportunities. And the question in the late uh, 90s was whether or not institutions can be held accountable for their inaction when there was peer on peer harassment because it wasn't the institution themselves doing the harassment. And the Supreme Court in a case called Davis versus Monroe County Board of Education said, yes, they could be liable, uh, but uh, they said that the contours of, and it was a Title IX case, it was a K-12 case, uh, 
but the contours of when a school was triggered to have you know, a responsibility to have action were confined by Title IX itself and some of these concepts, particularly because you are talking about responsibility for how they respond to someone else's actions. So they had to have actual knowledge. Constructive knowledge wasn't enough, according to the Supreme Court. And then it had to be severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive, you know, which was designed to make sure so it wasn't the most sensitive person who could decide what was said, you know, sets the rules across the board. Now, over the years, uh, there has been less and less support for that line on the left side of the political spectrum, saying that it was too hard to prove uh, discrimination uh, cases. I don't happen to share that, that point of view. Um, I, I, there are hundreds and hundreds of cases where schools have been held accountable using precisely that standard to me that demonstrates that it works and many, many cases where schools didn't follow that line and had their policies thrown out as unconstitutional for restricting too much speech. Lara, I'm not sure, did you wanna come in on this question around the hostile environment? No, I think that's fine. And I love the other question too. So. All right, we'll go there next. So how do we think about discourse and dialogue with the lens of the James Baldwin quote? Uh, quote, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. So Lara, why don't you take us that one first? Sure. So this is where, so it's, it's an important, it's an important quote. It's an important, um, it's an important ethos that I think is very central to what I would hope people would internalize for their work on campus, for their whether they're a professor or a student. Now, it's not the line the First Amendment draws, right? The First Amendment lets you go say, God hates fags at a fallen Marine's funeral. It lets you be the KKK. The First Amendment leaves all kinds of room for, for horrendous shenanigans. Now, classroom speech actually can be limited a bit more, right, than the public square. But I think the question shows us that, much as I like my lawyer credential, the answer to campus speech isn't gonna come from rules, lawyers, the First Amendment, right? The operative uh, somewhat less lofty quote than James Baldwin around the way I think of this comes from Jurassic Park. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And the work that I think Project on Civil Discourse and Roger's, Roger's work is about is how do we work the you should? How do we work the skills of having those conversations? Now, I think about this a lot in connection with our current pandemic and the question of when, when the pandemic was starting, right? I said this incredibly naive, now ridiculous seeming thing that I wonder if our capacity to be so helpful to one another through mask wearing and distancing to be really the change and the, and the safety that our neighbors need would teach us all about something about how powerful we can be as agents for good. So yeah, so I did not predict the storyline well at all. That being said, right, we have that power in the classrooms. If you are going to say outrageous things that our constitution protects, you can call Joe and not be, not be expelled, not be prosecuted. And um, and, and even important things that the, that the Constitution protects that are, that are racial justice that your community doesn't like when you, when you do that, right? And he's there. Um, but that, that's, that's a limitation on the power of authority to, to censor us. It's not a blueprint for how to live. And so um, we do need to be investing in helping people learn how to do good and how to leverage their power um, to ask the important questions of each other and communicate with each other, but, um, but hopefully not to, to go need the services of FIRE or the ACLU because they're the KKK or something, because, because it's not what we're going for here on college campuses. Um, and, and that's where I think you know, the educators and the people who are running programs like Rogers and a smaller one like mine um, are, are really concerned right now. I mean, Roger, this, this one must come up a lot for you in so many of the dialogues that you facilitated over the years. How do you think about this question when, 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 when it's, it's almost like beyond dialogue or maybe it's something that dialogue can't solve? I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I use this quote actually in many presentations that I do on the topic. And, you know, I think it's a really salient quote for so many people in colleges and universities where what we experience is so much uh, different than what is described as our as our experience. And And, you know, it's one thing to say that you know, a professor um, has a right to teach James Baldwin's own work in a classroom that uses the N-word, right? And then, you know, be free from, you know, punitive action or uh, complaint uh, that a student might make. And it's a different thing to say that in a classroom, a student might utter the N word in a way that is directed at an individual and intended to harm and actually traumatize and disrupt in a way that is hugely problematic. And, and it's oftentimes when uh, BIPOC individuals like myself get into these conversations about what is free speech and what's protected or not, and whether or not it's harmful that we encounter the, the absoluteness of it is protected if it's uttered in a certain context. And we don't care about your personal experience of, as Joe appropriately pointed out, the real legitimate access to an equal education. And it's that hostile environment that gets created when these kinds of utterances are made that is hugely problematic and yet not protected in the same way around racial harassment as it is around sexual harassment. And that was kind of part of what my point was earlier as well. And I think that we need to really take that apart a little bit and really tease it up, tease it apart and, and look at it in ways that help us to at least have some discourse about it. I know we're running really short on time, so I'll be under 20 seconds and just say I agree with everything that I heard from both panelists on that last point. And I don't think we can ever censor our way out of racist beliefs. It has to be through dialogue. We're a better place to do that than on a college campus where people are meeting people who look different from them and live and learn, you know, with people who are different from them. And anyone who wants to look further into that can check out and just Google Daryl Davis. Uh, an, a remarkable person who doesn't try to punish people for overt racism, but tries to persuade them out of it uh, uh, as an African-American man who it befriends KKK people. Google his story. He's fantastic. Uh, uh, Lara, I'm not sure if you had a point, if you wanted to say something more there. No, I, um, I, I think, yeah, it's a very compelling story. I think one thing when we're in the classroom we want to be clear that that's it's not something that we're actually going to generally ask of our students to be that kind of person who engages in that. I don't want to write that check on another person's account and say this is the kind of trauma you undertake. And that's something that you know we talk about a lot when running classrooms is the burden of our system of free speech is not equally borne. It is unequally borne by the students in our classroom. And we have to be sensitive to that, that there will be people who take on the burdens like you know, the author that, that Joe mentioned. And then there'll be people who say, you know, I didn't come to college to be an unpaid race educator or dispenser of forgiveness. I came to college because I wanna be an accountant someday. And, um, and, and, that, and that is an equally acceptable way to be a college student um, but, I, but I think that it comes back to the same point of giving people opportunities for dialogue, particularly for understanding apology and redemption is a great thing that can happen on campuses, but people have to come willingly to the table. You know, to me, it, the conversation and this question speaks to something we actually started off with, which is, you know, the argument that free speech and diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, aren't at, necessarily at odds with one another. Um, and to me, actually, it, it maybe even goes a step further to say how 
uh, protections for free speech will be strengthened uh, and can be more effective when realizing that they, you know, must be um, upheld and enforced in, you know, in ways that balance uh, protections and the advancement of uh, equity and inclusion at the same time. Um, you know, to, to the to the you know question of um, you know which one to, to the question of of free speech, you know, as as a goal and a, as an aspiration for all. I think that is, uh, you know, the reality of of the United States of the, of higher education is that that principle of free speech, no matter how neutral or universal it is as an aspiration, still kind of exists in a real world with real historical legacy legacies and inequities. Um, and uh, you know, I think those are, it's important that you know to come back to the topic. The Biden administration keeps both in mind. I want to take a minute here at the end here just to thank uh, our co-sponsors uh, for today's event, the Project on Civil Discourse at American University and the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education at the University of Maryland, as well as our three fantastic panelists, Joe Cohn, Larry Schwartz, and Roger Worthington. Thank you to all of you for spending uh, the time with us, as well as the members of our audience for spending the past uh, hour with us. Uh, the Common Room returns in two weeks. Uh, please join us and stay tuned for our ch our, to our channels for a conversation about the line between classroom conduct and academic freedom. We'll see you then.